All right, folks, um, we're about ready to get going again. Uh, normally, it would be the role of the director of the Francis Lewis Law Center um, to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, and we have been incredibly blessed in that, um, of course, Louise can't be with us, but her son, Ruben Helper, has agreed to introduce our keynote speaker. So I'll turn things over to uh, Thank to you. Uh, so I'll quickly uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ruben Halper. I'm Louise Halper's youngest son. Uh, my mother, as you all know, couldn't be with us. Uh, but I do feel honored to give the introduction to today's keynote in her place. And uh, I can assure you that I'll be an extremely poor substitute for any introduction that my mother would have given. Uh, but since I'm already up here and the mic is on, you're stuck with me. Uh, so I'll apologize in advance for mangling the career of Mr. Castronova. Uh, <laughs> today's keynote speaker is obviously uh, Edward Castronova. He's a professor of telecommunications at University of Indiana Bloomington, as well as the director of graduate studies program there. Uh, he is the leading expert and often called the father of synthetic or virtual world economics. What began as a tongue-in-cheek economic report on the game EverQuest eventually became a groundbreaking paper entitled Virtual Worlds, a first-hand account of market and society on the Siberian frontier. Castronova expanded on that work in the book Synthetic Worlds, where he threw a light on the economics behind massively multiplayer online role-playing games, or more pegs. Up until that point, people had viewed Ultima, EverQuest, and other games simply as games that were the refuge of Dungeons and Dragons aficionados or people like the comic book guy from The Simpsons. Uh, Professor Castronova was one of the first to understand that it went beyond being simply a game for many people. And in a variety of ways, the distinction between the real world and the virtual world was becoming increasingly narrow, particularly in the economic sphere. Essentially, what he found is that there's no distinction between virtual and real money. The currency in these, in these worlds have a real world equivalent. I remember being uh, just blown away reading an article in Wired um, that was about synthetic worlds and the work that Professor Castanova was doing. Uh, and I ordered the book on Amazon, this was a few years ago, and it was just such a, a revelation reading things like the, uh, the per capita GDP of EverQuest inhabitants at the time was above India and China. Um, and that these things were becoming so real that people were actually setting up click shops, uh, essentially virtual sweatshops across the border from San Diego and Mexico, or in China where uh, people were playing 24 hours a day in these characters that they could then leverage online and sell for uh, hundreds or thousands of dollars. Um, in fact, at that time synth of that Synthetic Worlds was written, EverQuest currency was valued more than the lira or the yen. Uh, and I'd hate to think under the current climate what it's worth <laughs> against the dollar. <laughs> it's a haven. Yeah, cool. exactly. So, uh, judging from his bio page, uh, that includes the backdrop of World of Warcraft posters and what I'm guessing is the avatar, uh, it's clear that Professor Castanova is also an avid gamer. Uh, in fact, it's rumored that he has insisted that the University of Indiana pay off his uh, salary in World of Warcraft gold from here on out. <laughs> uh, in 2006, Casanova and his team were the recipients of a MacArthur grant to build a morpeg called uh, Arden, which is based around the plays of Shakespeare. But this is more than just a game in that it extended Casanova's petri dish theory of synthetic worlds. And that is the theory where environments, um, where various social and economic policies could be studied using people who are acting as they would in the real world. Imagine it like running multiple sciences experiments where the inputs are slightly, slightly tweaked uh, for a desired outcome to be reached. Uh, in fact, Castronova envisions much larger scale experiments that would allow for the testing of different pub public policy options on a range of issues in large scale synthetic worlds. Imagine if instead of the current mathemat mathematical models we have, uh, such as Bernanke's financial accelerator, the economic policies of the past few years or months could have been played out by real actors in a synthetic world. Uh, in the follow-up to his book, Synthetic Worlds, uh, Exodus to the Virtual World, Castronova examined how people from a wide range of backgrounds devote increasing amounts of time to the lives they build in these synthetic worlds, uh, and also examining what the impact this has on the lives and expectations in the real world of these participants. One doesn't really have to be a gamer to understand all this. Uh, if you look at just the recent internet traffic figures, for the first time, I think, since uh, the invention of the web, porn traffic is actually down. You know? And this is uh, a result of things like Facebook, MySpace, and more importantly, games like World of Warcraft uh, and other participatory games um, that Castronova has studied. Uh, in the context of this symposium, it interests me to hear what Professor Castronova and others have to say uh, in terms of children who grew up at these sites. These are relatively young sites. The participants are mainly uh, people who didn't, didn't grow up with these sites. So what does it mean for children who grew up in an environment of more pegs and spend all their life 
not really blending or blending the real and the synthetic. Um, and what are the implications of that? Uh, in the context of my work, I work in a, a sports technology company, and we actually uh, do a bunch of TV enhancements that you'd be familiar with, such as the first uh, first down yellow line. But we've ex since expanded into digital records of events, um, such that we're capturing uh, high quality GPS information off race cars. And what that enables us to do is create uh, a wider or a niche virtual world uh, for, say, NASCAR fans. And they can go online, subscribe to a, a 3D product where we render uh, the cars and the racetrack, and they can follow any car. So it's not enough for them to be passive uh, consumers of the broadcast. They actually have to be essentially active players where they're interacting, uh, and they are able to choose any camera view, things like that. But beyond that, we're working with companies like EA in terms of actually allowing people to be in the race, so allowing them to be a participant uh, and what's the meaning in terms of uh, allowing yourself to be the 44th car uh, or allowing yourself to actually hit the baseball pitch? Um, what does that mean when people don't just become consumers of the broadcast or consumers of the media, but they're actually putting themselves up against the real world participants? Um, so with that, I would just like to turn it over to Mr. Castronova and thank him for his work and uh, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Thanks. So, thank Thanks you. Very much. introduction and uh, just, you know, more evidence of how one apparently wonderful woman can have uh, such uh, wide circles of influence, positive effects. And as someone who didn't know her, you know, I'm clearly basking in what was a wonderful aura right now, and it's an honor. Um, it's an honor to keynote anything, but an accumulation of people such as this, I, you know, I don't feel worthy. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable giving a keynote at Washington and Lee University because it was only a year and a half ago that they stole away one of the <laughs> big exciting talents that we had at IU. Um, there was a time when I thought I won't ever go to Washington and Lee, but here I am. Um, and uh, I wish you all the, all the best uh, with Joshua. Uh, what <laughs> yeah, I just wish, you know. but anyway. Uh, that, what are you, you going to do? That's what happens in academia. Uh, but uh, what I want to talk about today is going to take some of the themes of this presentation in a slightly different direction. I mean, um, a couple of years ago, I realized that uh, I thought a lot about the people who, who have been warning us about global warming uh, and, and what, what kind of a professor is that? You know, so much, so much of our time, so, so much of our research efforts are focused on and properly so, on uh, you know, sort of advancing within the paradigm and, and coming up with concrete, objective findings that we can all rely on. And we couldn't obviously do anything if people didn't do that sort of stuff. But I felt, starting around, right around 2004, 2005, that there's also a need for someone to be speculative. And so this idea of a speculative professor, professoriate or speculative professional activity is something that I think most academics are uncomfortable about, but it's often important. So again, you know, thinking about global warming, someone at some point had to put together all of the research and say, you know, it looks like in 100 years, something like this is going to happen and we ought to start thinking about it. That's not science with a capital S at that point. It's, it turns into something more of an advocacy but I don't think it's complete, uh, it's completely without rules. And so I've been really trying to think hard about how do you speculate about what technology is going to do in a professional and responsible way. So my second book, Exodus to the Virtual World, was an attempt to speculate about what's going to happen to public policy. Now, and, and Ruben did a fa fantastic job of, of um, glossing over what I feel has been sort of leaping from failure to failure over the past um, seven or eight years. I've been enjoying every moment of it. It's great fun. But still, you know, it's not, it, it's not always pretty. And uh, one, one theme that has been always sort of sitting off to the side is something I'm going to be able to address today. I've been thinking a lot about the impact of um, sexuality in virtual worlds on human life, but not from the standpoint necessarily of its impact on today's children, but more about how we evolve demographically as a species. And so I felt that um, in the keynote role of a, uh, of a uh, um, gathering like this, with this sort of a theme, 
might be an opportunity for us all to reflect on some longer range implications of the material that we saw this morning, some of the arguments that we saw this morning. If there's anything that can be said about the, this, this sort of fantastic work that we're seeing where people are trying to look at the effects of media, the, the step that needs to be taken is maybe the hardest step. Is think one of the bigger, bigger implications of this if we don't do our policies right. And so, I'm, you know, a keynote is often going off on a limb. I don't expect everyone to agree with everything I'm saying. I and mean, let me just say I'm just trying to provoke um, some thinking about the impact of virtual reality on human fertility. Um, it, some of it may, some of the direction and tone may be surprising to some of you. As you know, I'm a gamer. I'm typically a big supporter of gaming, and I'm the kind of person who's going to say, nope, there's nothing wrong. It is the most wonderful technology ever. And this is not going to um, come to that sort of conclusion, certainly this part. But I've also had a change of heart as my own children have grown older, and I've seen myself what I view to be some fairly disturbing behavior of my five-year-old and uh, how he reacts to his game being taken away. Um, three years ago, I would have said, there's no such thing as video game addiction. And then I've dealt with my five-year-old yelling and screaming, and all I'm doing is turning off the television. He doesn't do that when I turn off SpongeBob. But boy, is he, there's certain games where he turns off. And by the way, speaking of games, there are a couple of games that weren't mentioned this morning I'd like to point out. My five-year-old is loving them, and I'm loving that he's playing them. One is called Boom Blocks, which is a great game on the Wii of kids stacking up blocks and knocking them down. So it's like a virtual blocks game. And uh, you can design new setups and leave them in that sacred sp space of the video game. So I, that's one that he's spent a lot of time um, playing with. Another is called Wizard 101, which is a, a virtual world where the kids are all uh, wizards and uh, and that we're, we're letting them have a lot of time on that, and uh, it's, it's, there's no, uh, no violence in it, but it's, it seems to be very immersive for him. He really likes it. He still gets too much screen time. So, Greg, if you can explain how we're supposed to stop that. I don't know. Um, all right, so uh, another, let me just point out, now I, I just finished this up a couple of days ago, and I ran it past my students, and uh, they gave me some feedback that I'm going to have to do verbally because I didn't have time to actually change the slides. One of the things they told me I had to warn you all about is that I'm approaching this from the standpoint of evolutionary psychology. So a lot of what we're seeing, like let's say with age play in virtual worlds, you know, my colleague Bryant Paul has written a paper called Barely Legal. And in it, he points out quite clearly that from an evolutionary standpoint, um, the idea that older men would be interested in 14 and 15 year old girls is easy enough to understand that it makes us uncomfortable. Right? And so, um, we're, we're at a moment where we have to recognize that that child that Dorothy talked about who sees himself in the mirror, they didn't have mirrors in the environment of evolutionary adaptation. So this is a new thing for the human, the human corpus to deal with, the, the concept of a mirror. And um, one of the phrases we use in my department is the concept of a Stone Age mind dealing with contemporary technology. And so that's where a lot, a lot of my um, thinking about this comes out. Um, and of course, the, the compelling question we have before us, what is the state's interest? Does the state have an interest? Um, so I'm going to start here with, with a, a series of slides that I first wrote up in May 2005 and had no idea what to do with them. And uh, I'm going to walk through them um, fairly quickly. Uh, just, but it's, it's more my way of sort of proving to myself that, that I've been thinking about this for a long time. And it was, it's just a, a sort of a speculation on the nature of reality and, and the connection between money, which is an economist, that's what I've been studying, and um, human sexuality. So first part, um, this is actually, I ended up designing it so it was supposed to be something that someone would watch silently while looking on their own computer and I'll just talk through it. First, I give an example of how um, gold is virtual and just as valuable as uh, real money. So, example from Blizzard Entertainment's World of Warcraft. Here's a dollar bill. The argument here is going to be that a dollar bill is actually virtual currency. One piece of evidence in the early 1920s, the picture on the left is a German mark bill, 50 marks that would buy a loaf of bread in 1920. By 1923, it took 20 billion marks to buy a loaf of bread. So the notion of 
paper currency having value, and that's why it's real and not virtual. And here, the, it, the value is obviously very elastic. Um, here's a picture of the auction house in World of Warcraft. Let's zoom in. Um, uh, you can see the items here on the left, dark phantom cape, um, heart-seeking crossbow. I don't know how easy it is to see with these. Because yeah, I, have, I have dark slides. So you can see war bear woolies and things like that. Um, but the thing I want to focus on is there, there are prices here, just like on eBay. So you could buy out a heart-seeking crossbow for 150 gold. That is a free market price. My analysis of this, my specialization as an economist, this is an ordinary, robust market. No reason to suspect that that price does not re re reflect the intersection of marginal cost and marginal benefit. Um, here's another free market. It's a market on eBay, which doesn't exist anymore, but it did exist. Um, there, there's still um, lots and lots of sales of gold. So this is uh, World of Warcraft gold pieces. Oops. This thing? I always get screwed up with this. There's the light. Ah, laser. Okay, so here's the um, exchange rate, $129 US to get 1,000 gold pieces in World of Warcraft. And the screenshot was taken. And these markets have existed now for 10 or 15 years, maybe more. Very robust, again, I have no reason to suspect that this price does not reflect the marginal value of the item. But it implies that um, a US dollar is worth seven gold pieces. If you say, no, it isn't, then you, know, then you have to say that a yen is not worth, 100 yen is not worth a dollar either. It's just an exchange rate market. And that implies that a gold piece is worth 13 pennies, which means that the heart-seeking crossbow in the um, auction house picture I just showed is actually worth $19.50. So I've made a lot of hay out of adding up these numbers and showing how big they are. If you've got millions of people playing these games and they're buying and selling things that cost you know, $20, you're gonna get a pretty sizable GDP and that's where that number comes from. And it blows people away because they think this can't possibly be serious. So what I was trying to do with this talk, say listen, you can't, you're, you're not gonna agree that these virtual coins are worth something then I, I thought, what's another route into your mind to show you that virtual things can feel like real things, real essence? And so I went to um, uh, the human body and our erotic response to the human body with this set of slides. So uh, Daniel Moreno is uh, just some guy, I've never met him, and he makes 3D images. And the way you make 3D images is you go get models. You can get um, stock photographs of uh, models on 3D modeling sites smiling, holding pens, standing with their arms out. And then what Daniel Moreno does is he starts making a human image. Here's the wireframe. And then he puts um, a skin on the wireframe. And then he colors it and shades it and does lighting. And you know you have to understand that doing lighting of human skin is an incredibly complicated thing because light penetrates the skin. And so it's really a lot of work, what you're looking at here. This is now several years old is uh, just a very high art. So this, you know, he, he made this 3D figure and then took several screenshots of it and that was, that was his art. So between the, the virtual dollar, or the virtual money, let's say, and the virtual woman, um, you know, this led me to some speculations on the nature of the real. Is she real? How real does she have to be? And then the real question is, whether she's real or not, does it matter? What if her superior design makes her better at the functions we ask of her, better than any real counterpart? That is, what if the virtual things we make come to be better servants of our evolutionary psychological impulses than the things we find in the real world? Now, I have this slide because I was trying to persuade people about this slide. Is the gold piece real? How real does it have to be? Whether real or not, what if the superior design makes it better at the functions we ask of it, better than any real counterpart? So what if we made a money system that was superior? What if we made an economy that was superior? There's a book coming out by um, uh, Byron Reeves and Leighton Reed where they are going to argue that the organizational structures inside massively multiplayer games are a better way to run a business than the current hierarchies we have game's going to be called Games at Work. So, you know, what if these 
games are evolving, some kind of human institutions that are, for whatever reason, more attractive. The purpose of this talk is maybe it's easier to persuade people about the money, and now what happens if this becomes true? With the, and, and I'm going to point to some increases in technology that make me increasingly persuaded um, that this kind of a question is big. Now, this is obviously from a, a male gendered perspective. I'm admitting that, but I'm assuming everybody can, male hetero, everybody can make their own translation. Um, just putting my personality out there. In that kind of a context, the whole notion of what's real and what's not real starts to fade away as a useful category. I'm not saying it isn't true. I'm not saying it, it isn't possible to say that's, that's a thing in fantasy and that thing isn't. But I think what, what, what we were talking about this morning is our ability to make those distinctions, our drive to make those distinctions, our motivation to make those distinctions may increasingly fade away. As it, and I'm saying this, this is a descriptive sort of prediction, not a normative one. I'm just saying this may be the direction where we're going. And that might lead to some end. And I started to think, well, what would be the end of this situation if suddenly our virtual lives started to seem like they were better than our real lives. So let me, um, let me make an argument, um, at least for the importance of thinking about this. I mean, uh, there is this notion of the singularity out there, which says uh, basically that there's going to be an exponential growth in computation. There's one underway right now and has since the early 70s. And most computer experts that I talk to, do n I haven't heard anyone say that uh, processing power is about to slow down. They do talk about coming to the end of the silicon chip. But typically, the next sentence is, however, there are a million different sorts of material on which one can do computations. And you know, while we seem to be maxing out silicon, like, like simple things like a chip is 2D, or what if they make it 3D? You know, all of a sudden, you have another, now you're doing, instead of area ca calculations, volume calculations for the rate of increase in um, computation. So I, I remain not completely convinced, but I remain <coughs> reasonably um, certain that computation will continue to accelerate. Right? And the singularity is this notion that at some point there's going to be a mashup of human and artificial intelligence. And just the two worlds will sort of meld together sometime in the next hundred years. Uh, this, Chief Technical Officer of Intel, who obviously has an interest in this, but anyway, he's saying it's going to happen by 2048. Who knows? Probably on, you know, on October 3rd, 2048. That was the date he was given his time. Um, but it is, you know, it's something to keep in mind. Multiple people from different sources are simply pointing at the growth in computation and saying, well, something's going on here. So what would be the impact of that? Um, the, the singularity, the mashup of artificial and human intelligence, I think when we first think about it, we think about images like this. I think this image is completely and utterly wrong. There is no, it, there's no sense in my mind that if things develop in this direction, we have nothing to be concerned about. Because I, I can't imagine someone with a big TV on their head saying, wow, I feel so immersed in some other reality. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I do feel like I, I'm immersed in a reality where some cruel person has put this big box on my head. <laughs> and, and I want to be freed immediately. And I didn't consent to this. Where's the form? Um, here comes the IRB, you know, with their laser beams and jackbooted thugs um, to protect her. Where are they, actually? <laughs> you know, I couldn't get away with this. Um, I think this is actually a corporate promo. So it isn't going to be like this. One of, one of the insights that came to me at an early point in this research is it is amazing how much immersion happens with someone who just has this as their virtual reality device. Just this. And it's because their, their emotions go into it. It's not the hardware, it's the software, it's the stories, it's the characters, it's the art. So it's not going to be this, but it's going to be other things. So let me... Um, show you um, some examples of where technology is today. This came out just a couple of, uh, couple of months ago. Lifelike animation heralds new era for computer games. on video, and then the video is analyzed by our computer software, and the actress performance is used to drive any facial rig. 
client gets back and animation grows on the way. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> well, I think that they have a long way to go. Mm, I've seen better. It sucks. Whew. I mean, really? Can, can we just skip that question? They really, really are bad. saw images of Red Light Center. Um, I don't know how many of you were particularly attracted or not attracted to those, but um, this is, seems to be at a different scale. This, this is simulation that is approaching um, cinematic verity. Um, and that leads to the question everyone is asking about the sim singularity, which is, how will the singularity help me get more sex? Um, and this, uh, you know, tongue-in-cheek, of course, but this question was actually posed to this fellow, Ray Kurzweil, who is the father of this notion of singularity, as part of one of these Chablis and Gouda tech confabs that, that are held every once in a while. He's up on stage, and he's taking questions from the audience on a three-by-five card, and the moderator hands it to him. It's like, how will the singularity help me get more sex? And he goes into a lengthy, about half an hour discussion with the moderator about virtual reality and sexuality, and his... Uh, view was that version 3.0 of virtual reality, which I don't know if that picture was version 3.0 or 2.8 or whatever it was, <laughs> one point something. Um, whether that will provide really good sex uh, without, w while avoiding the risks of traditional sexual intercourse as experienced circa 2000. So whatever you think the risks of traditional, I mean, there are a number of uh, terms here that could be interrogated. You know, what do you mean traditional sexual intercourse? What do you mean risks? What's really good sex? Um, and it's, you know, there's a subjective element to that, but there's also, you know, is there a state interest in, is there a public common good notion of, well, that's good sex, no, 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 that's bad sex. I mean, clearly there are some areas, lewd and lascivious behavior is a, is a category. So, um, you know, those issues are coming up here and his view is very positive. He says, clearly, you know, as we approach the future, there are gonna be some great things about the sex we're gonna have. Um, and we're going to avoid some of the bad things about um, real sex. Now, so that was way back when, I don't know, a million years ago in internet time. So I'm researching this topic for a paper I'm, I'm writing with a couple of graduate students in this Brian Paul thing. We're going to take Second Life avatars and see if people's physiological reactions are the same to them as they are to filmed porn. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm looking for links for that paper, and I'm, I just type in, you know, virtual sex, and WebMD is the top link. I mean, look at this. Everything you've been afraid to ask about sex in cyberspace. You can go to WebMD. It's been reviewed by Sheldon Marks, MD. I was having sex with a Dutch girl, and my wife walked in. What do you think about this, I asked. Um, she said, it's a little weird, because the Dutch girl wasn't real. Well, not really real. She was an avatar in Second Life, the online 3D digital world, blah, blah, blah. Here's a real person making your avatar. Virtual sex can be a little complicated, he says. Um, and they introduce down here this term, where is it? Uh, teledildonics. Teledildonics, okay? So teledildonics is um, a set of technologies that allow sexual stimulation devices to be controlled remotely over the internet. Yeehaw. So it's on WebMD, so it's already mainstreaming, which means we're going from internet porn to virtual reality porn. So I don't need to do these slides because, you know, the old circa 1992, they're schnaggles, free porn links, whatever. Um, this is being superseded by Red Light Center, which is um, what, what we saw before, so I don't even have to show that. So we're already, um, we're already you know, aware. But there's some other things going on that I think um, are worth, worth thinking about. Um, there's the KISS phone. The KISS phone, let's have a look. Here's the KISS phone. Opens up new frontier and teledildonic possibilities. <laughs> you kiss the lips, the lips respond to your kiss and record your kiss, and the other person holds the phone up to their <laughs> cheek, or wherever, and gets the kiss. The KISS phone. Um, your imaginations run wild. Um, <laughs> Zoltan, who's a guy in the Republic of Georgia, 
took, apparently he took a rubber doll and gave it AI. So he made himself a sex robot. And here's a long story on, what is this, Gizmodo, about Zoltan and his sex robot. So, you know, of course, the, the combination of virtual reality and artificial intelligence and dildonic devices, phrase I hadn't heard before I started doing this, um, I call them other names. Uh, you know, that, you know, there's clearly some sort of an explosive combination there. And then the last one, horny Brits plug into internet vibrator. So this is a story about, um, an actual story about devices, internet vibrators, and horny, for if anyone here is from England, I apologize. Um, you're not the only ones. Uh, the, you know, that the can control the KISS phone extended to other sorts of devices. The interesting thing is that last headline is from 2005. So it's already many years old. This is actually an established technology. Um, and as of you know, 2008, here's the state of an iPod. If anyone's under 18, run away right now. I should have said that. Here's an internet-enabled um, vibrator. There's, um, for, for this and other types of toys, this is a client server service called HiJoy. So you and your partner buy the toys and then you log into highjoy.com, you have an account there, and that handles the communications between the toys. And this is a you know, sophisticated um, setup. And here's something interesting, the Wiimote, I'll just talk this through, the Wiimote guts, the thing, I don't, those of you who don't know, the Wiimote is a, it's a, if you haven't played the Wii, you basically have something like this, and you're playing a tennis game, and you just stand there going like that. And the, the, the Wii is able to, to read what you're doing and apparently this ability of a device at a distance to read the motion of this device is something that is a, it's a patented technology. And it, the technology was apparently co-developed for the Wii Remote as well as teledildonics. So, you know, that might make you think differently about your Wii, Wii modes. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a church-going Roman Catholic, so I'm, I've got to express to you, none of this is comfortable for me. I'm just <laughs> trying to... You know, or maybe it's more comfortable than I care to admit. Um, and I'll be at confession tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so this, so wait, so let me just stop here. This is a point where my students said I had to stop and pause and say something. Where is all this going? I mean, the argument I'm putting forward, obviously, through all these things, is that there's an increasing role of distance technology in human sexuality. And you might, you know, you know, I'm obviously I'm putting forward this thesis that it's something to think about in terms of human beings reacting to it. My own view is that there isn't anything natural in the brain that makes us stop. That, that all the evidence we have about mediated images is that, for example, like turkeys, you know, turkeys get excited if you build a female turkey out of wire and feathers. You know, and the turkeys get very horny looking at it. And you say, oh, those stupid turkeys, but if I put a magazine out, <laughs> you know, Human beings get excited at two-dimensional, you know, depictions. So, you know, there's, our brains don't, at, at the level of, of sexual response, are not really good at distinguishing fantasy and reality. And in fact, there seems to be all this incentive to just keep the beer goggles on and, you know, sort of live in the fantasy and, and, and be in play when we're in, in sexuality. So from an evolutionary psychology standpoint, this, the argument is that there is not going to be any stop to this. That as technology gets better, the toys will get better, the sexual feelings will get stronger, and we will spend more and more of our time getting it off with one another through these devices than face to face. That's like, that's the thesis. That's what I'm putting out there. And my students said, "You've got to make that more explicit." So there it is. You know, that's the sense I'm getting, and this is the a problem that I I, I want to sort of address as we go forward. So one response to this, the obvious response, is. Well, undoubtedly, there are many aspects of human sexuality that cannot be replicated by a virtual reality environment, however sophisticated. So you imagine the most sophisticated, amazing virtual reality environment. There are some aspects of human sexuality that it simply cannot replicate, such as this. Which brings us back to the theme of uh, the conference today. Is well, you know, maybe the break to this is going to be that human beings want to pass on their genes. They want to have babies. And so then that thinks, well, all right, so everybody feels great getting off with things on the internet long run, you know, three generations from now, that's all anyone's doing. But the urge to have children is something that still causes us to get up 
out of the chair and go out and meet other real people? Well, virtual reality has answers for that as well. Um, there are already multiple virtual baby sites on the internet. And those of you who've had children, like, you know, these, I'm not sure these are getting all the way to the real experience. And maybe, well, I'm gonna get to that. It's like a, an adorable, cute, cuddly, and sometimes cranky virtual baby. If it was my kids, it would be a very cranky, sometimes adorable, cute, and cuddly virtual <laughs> baby. So, you know, they're, they're obviously working on um, looking at the positive side. And there's just multiple sites. Mag's Nursery, you know, you can, uh, you know, if, you, if this is something that is a fantasy, a heroic moment you want to live, there you go, you can do it. Um, and, and we also, I won't go to them, but we heard a lot about the pet sites today. Um, the people, you know, and I'm not saying babies are like pets, or, but you know, there's some possibility then that virtual reality would eventually be able to satisfy, to some extent, the drive we have to take care of cuddly things that look like us. And in fact, maybe the advantage of them is that most of the time our babies don't look like this. There's a lot of this going on <laughs> as well. And I was concerned when I put this slide is I don't know if I'm supposed to be talking during lunch. <laughs> you know, I already have a head wound. And I mean, you know, showing barfing baby. It's a marvelous shot. It reminds me of so much time at home. Um, so the real question here is how much do we really like the machine? How much will the machine sort of draw us in, both in terms of our one-on-one -on -one sexual content, contact, but as well as um, the, you know, our drives for uh, uh, parenting? And you know, just to be explicit about this, my question is, would we go far enough into virtual reality that we would make ourselves extinct? Is it possible that we would just stop having babies? Um, so I want to show you a video. This is the kind of behavior I've seen no, 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 no. from my own son. It's been like this. that this is a technology, uh, you know, and this is 2008, you know, who can imagine what's coming in the future? If we have children growing up and uh, have this level of emotional and psychosocial dependence on this technology, um, is it possible that we would just become so naturally in that environment we would forget in some way to reproduce ourselves? Is that possible? Um, so as the economist, then I respond to myself saying, well, I don't think that's really possible because this technology is expensive, isn't it? I mean, these things are expensive. It has to be supported through a thriving economy. Any effect of virtual reality on fertility would surely be tempered by the need to sustain productivity and income. In other words, if we don't have enough economic activity, people going out working, we won't be able to support the servers and the art and the network and so on. And it'll fall apart. So that put me in mind to start thinking theoretically. Uh, you know, mathematically, theoretically. And I, I decided that I would try and sketch out a model, a formal model of um, human fertility under the circumstances that I've just described, where there's a technology that's expensive, but that technology re reduces the fertility of the people who adopt it. And just, this isn't just about virtual reality, I guess. I mean, fertility rates are plummeting in Europe. You know, it's 
So this, you know, what do we do about the fact that uh, there seems to be this sort of move, whether it's because of technology or culture, away from having kids? So here's a, a speculative model of technological extinction. Here are the assumptions. First, it assumes there's a technology that people may or may not adopt. So there's some random basis on which people decide whether or not to basically get into virtual reality. If they don't adopt virtual reality, they replicate generation by generation. So if you don't adopt virtual reality technology, you just recreate yourself. But if you do adopt virtual reality technology, there's some probability that you won't replicate yourself. So it might be that the probability of replication is 0 0.9, 0 0.2, something like that. People who adopt the technology have lower fertility. Um, the model assumes that there's a distribution of interest in the technology. So there's some people who really think it's great, and when they encounter virtual reality, they think, oh, this is awesome, I want to be in it. And other people really hate it. They say, this is the stupidest thing in the world, and I'll never take it. This basic desire for the technology that individuals have depends on inheritance. So if your parents like virtual reality, you're more likely to like it. If they didn't like it, you're less likely to like it. Um, and also cultural factors. So if a lot of people are doing VR, you'll do VR. Um, and, and, or if VR is, uh, Greg talked about this a little bit, the idea of a technology like, the, like Hollywood movies that seems to broadcast itself without advertising. It's like use propagates itself. So it's like a culturally powerful um, evolutionary factor. So that will also affect whether or not people like it. You grow into life and if everybody's doing VR and VR is kind of a hunting sort of technology that's always pushing itself in your face, you're more likely to adopt it. Whether or not you adopt the technology depends on all of these taste factors as well as the cost of the technology. So if it's expensive to support, you know, if you take on the technology, you have to contribute to supporting it. If it's expensive, you may choose not to become a user of the technology because you can't pay the fees. Um, the number of other adopters obviously matters. And then this issue that I just mentioned, the idea to which the technology propagates strongly, like Greg's example of Hollywood movies, um, the alternative is the idea that once someone goes into virtual reality, maybe they become marginalized. Nobody even hears about it. They just sort of disappear from society, in which case that would be sort of a technology hiding from everyone else, and that would sort of reduce its ability to propagate. So I have a model. I have parameters for all this. Um, you know, so there's basically, there's a, a, this function here turns any linear uh, equation z into a number between 0 and 1. So this modification just turns the probability of adoption into a, into a probability. I'm sorry, it turns the factors that people think about into a probability. Here are those factors. Um, there, whether or not your parents adopted the technology will affect positively whether you do. Here's your tastes for the technology, B, the benefits you get from it. Here's the cost parameter. That's the cost of the technology. It's divided among those who adopt. S is the share of the population that adopts. And it's the population size. So this is the number of adopters here. It's cost per adopter. If the costs are more expensive, you're less likely to adopt. If there are fewer adopters, you're also less likely to adopt. Um, this is this, this uh, property of the technology to either hide or hunt. If it's a hunting technology, if it expresses itself very aggressively, this is a big positive number. If the technology marginalizes its users, this would be a negative number. And then this is a viral factor. It says the share of adoption in the population has a positive effect, beta, on this Z parameter. So all these things, when they go up, increase the probability of adoption. And my method is to simply pick some, to pick some parameters for this and then just sort of explore the nature of the system. My question is, will the humans become extinct before the technology collapses because it's too expensive? You know, if you imagine the size of the population getting small, and then, oh, it's so small, we don't have the economy to support the technology, so boom, it's the technology that falls, and then the human beings come back again. Is it that kind of system? Or can we actually have a set of parameters where it gets small, and the technology sticks around, and then it's just like, bleep, the people are gone. Uh, and there's some other factors, which... So here are the scenarios I have for this. Um, for all these scenarios I run through, I take a spreadsheet and I make a society of a thousand people. I let the society run for 50 generations. And then I just go through this process saying, okay, what is the chance that you adopt? Do a random number generator. Okay, you either adopt the technology or you don't. If you do adopt the technology, you're less likely to have a baby. And then I, I sort of parameterize that difference in probability. 
and then sort of go generation by generation. If you um, don't have a baby, obviously you don't replicate yourself, so you're no longer in the gene pool. So there's a possibility that people with high tastes for this technology would wipe themselves out. Um, so there are eight different scenarios that I, I walked through. Let me just talk about maybe one or two of them and then the results in general. So scenario one, for example, says that, well, what if it were the case that the technology was very costly? This is a high, I put that parameter very, very high. And um, the second thing I do is, that let's say that the fertility effects, the fertility of people who adopt is actually quite high, that they're almost completely replicating themselves, like 0.9. So that the persons, people who don't take the technology replicate 100% of the time. The people who do take virtual reality, maybe they only replicate 90% of the time. So that's a high fertility scenario. There's a lot of fertility among VR users. They're still going out there having their babies. Um, and these numbers are just how I parameterize that. So that's the fertility effect, and this is the cost of the technology. And then I contrast that to, well, what happens if the fertility effect is a lot lower? So if you adopt virtual reality, you're only 20% likely to have a baby. You just love VR so much. Um, versus lowering the cost, cutting the cost in half, what's that impact? And then five, six, seven, and eight take the first and fourth scenario and either have the technology marginalize its users, the hiding technology, or the technology is aggressive and it broadcasts itself and it goes looking for new users. My students told me I have to take quite a lot of time on this slide, so let's work through it. The dark letters, or I'm sorry, the dark lines um, represent the high cost, high fertility scenario. I'm sorry, the high cost, low fertility scenario. These are both low fertility scenarios. So in the dark one, this and this, we have that the technology is very, very expensive. The top line shows population. The bottom line shows the number of people who adopt virtual reality. So what happens? You introduce virtual reality, and 100 out of the 1,000 people adopt it. They immediately um, have a negative impact on the population. So they stop having babies. And the population starts to fall. But as it falls, it falls more among the VR people than everyone else. So VR adoption is falling as well. In fact, it falls almost to zero. So this is a case of you put in VR technology, the nerds go in, they stop having babies, and they disappear. And you see that once they're gone, population stabilizes. So it's a case of, okay, people who use VR make themselves extinct, extinct, and the rest of us go on. And the remaining population has comparatively low preferences for virtual reality. So all the fantasists, the people who just have got to be in VR, go bye-bye in this scenario. And the reason is because VR is just so expensive. That, that it's just not worth it for people unless they have a strong desire to do it. If they have a strong desire to do it, they weed themselves out of the population. But what if we said the technology gets very inexpensive, that because of computation and so on, it becomes cheaper and cheaper to do this? Those are the gray lines. Here's what happens to population under that assumption, and that's the only thing that changed, we just made virtual reality cheap. And this is what happens to adoption. It remains pretty consistently at about 50%. So what that story is saying is that you introduce VR, lots of people go into it because it's fairly cheap. Those people you know, don't breed. And as time goes by, VR keeps picking off more of who remains. In other words, the, the taste for virtual reality does not get eliminated from the population because the costs are so low that a lot of people still find it good. And um, each new generation that is born, there's about half of them that say, yeah, this is worth it for me. And off they go and it's lost. And um, that scenario is what leads to dramatic population collapse. So running through the eight scenarios, um, there are different results each time. So when VR is very expensive, but there's not much difference in fertility, not too many people adopt, and you only lose a little bit of population. So what's happening there, again, is that people who adopt the technology weed themselves out. <coughs> um, if there are big fertility effects, the same thing happens, but you get more population loss. Um, if you lower the cost of the technology, though, this is where you get things like everybody adopts the technology, and you know, 95% of the people are lost. That's in the high fertility scenario. And with the low cost, low fertility scenario, so VR is cheap and it has a big impact on fertility. Nobody adopts because within 23 generations, no matter how many times I re-simulated this, there are no more people. So the, the people with a desire for VR are not 
able to weed themselves out of the system quickly enough, and eventually the population falls to zero. Um, if you add this, the idea of the technology either marginalizing its users or going out aggressively after new users, I mean, the main thing to look at is scenario eight here. A very aggressive technology speeds up the extinction a lot more quickly. Whereas if, if the technology is hiding its users away, um, these, a lot of these um, population losses can be avoided. So this is a speculative model, obviously. You know, this is a reduced form expression of a system that is obviously much more complex in the real world. But it is a way to examine some of the generic features of the environment that I think we're going to be in. So one of the things that, that I found was that technology cost has a non-discrete effect on population. That there, there's basically a break point. At one level of cost, the system is one where VR people make themselves extinct before having any impact on anyone else. But when the cost falls below that break point, VR technology becomes mainstreamed and causes a very dramatic loss in population. Um, hiding technology, one that marginalizes its users, um, causes population to decline nonetheless. So even though it hides people away, population still declines. And we will lose those people. And then finally, a low-cost hunting technology will almost certainly find and destroy pockets of non-adopters. So, you know, if it's a low enough cost, the technology will go out and find people and basically uh, draw them in and then we lose the fertility there. Um, my own priors uh, on this are, are that, you know, it's going to be pretty low cost. So the, the final questions, I mean, all of this just leads to questions, it's something to think about, is whether or not virtual reality will actually replace both sex and parenting and to what extent. Will virtual reality become that cheap that, that it'd be possible for someone with a cell phone and, you know, has sunshine to power it could be in a virtual reality environment? And then will virtual re reality be marginalized or mainstream as we go forward? Thank you very much.